Thank you so much for those introductions. Um, so yes, if you don't know me, my name is Sophie Novicki, as you've heard. I've had the chance to uh, lead the ISMIP 6 with, um, but this whole effort um, has not been possible without the hard work of so many people. Uh, here I'm highlighting the figures and the photos of my wonderful steering committee. And one thing to note straight away is that basically we're a fairly international group. Um, but I do want to uh, acknowledge NETA for my own funding, uh, especially the cryosphere map and the sea level change programs, and CLIC, the climate and cryosphere, which is a targeted activity of the WCRP, has always been uh, a key sponsor in all of our workshops. Uh, they also provide amazing technical support for us, such as wikis and um, mailing list. So, I mean, why uh, an ice sheet uh, met within um, MIP 6 or within CMIP 6 sorry? Well, if you think back about um, the ice sheets and sea level within IPCC cycles, um, we are now in AR6, the sixth cycle. Um, but then the first two um, 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 IPCC reports, um, the FAR and the SAR, considered ice sheets to be kind of passive elements of the climate system which meant that uh, ice sheets would only respond to um, changes in snowfall. So having a dynamic component or dynamic ice sheet models was not really a key priority. Um, in AR6, if you remember, this is when we had the observations of rapid changes. Um, and basically what happened there is that um, all of the ice sheet models got really criticized because we couldn't reproduce present the observations and it was considered that the projections were basically useless. Um, in AR5, what happened is that um, you basically had an uh, integrated community effort already. Um, there was uh, the uh, CRISE efforts, which I co-led with Bob Binshaner in the US, and uh, the ice to sea effort uh, in the UK and Europe, sorry, um, which basically tried to provide projections with uh, new improved models from AR5 to AR5. Uh, we kind of succeeded a bit, um, but what we were lacking was really being better integrated with the CIMIP uh, climate communities because basically we couldn't uh, have any uh, good forcings for ice sheet models. So ISMIP 6 really started after AR5, that's when we put the wheels into motion um, and uh, we're now very, very close to AR6. Uh, so it's been a long process. As, men as Richard mentioned, uh, we are targeted activity of uh, CLIC. Um, and then we address, um, and of, of course, we've also been endorsed by CNIP6. Um, and so we try to tackle two of the big questions that the WCRP has, uh, cryosphere in a changing climate and uh, the future sea level grand challenges. Uh, models taking part, uh, we are a group of um, either uh, ice sheets coupled to climate models. So um, those are in the table. Uh, so we have a dozen participants, and this was key because to be endorsed by CIMIP 6, you need to have uh, climate modeling centers that say, yes, I want to take part in the effort. And that number is uh, quite impressive for a new MIP. But then if you look at, so at the numbers of participating ISHIP models, those are the guys that are at universities or national labs, they're not coupled to climate models. Uh, basically that number is huge, it's about threefold bigger. Again, please notice that our, part our participants come uh, throughout the world and um, it was very nice to see on the line, for example, today, uh, we have one of the members from Evie, uh, Thomas Kleiner. All right, so um, what are our goals on experimental design? Well, this has not changed since uh, my first introduction in 2017. Um, our real goal is to uh, estimate the past and future sea level contribution from the ice sheets, but we also want to understand the uncertainty in sea level that we are projecting. Our second goal is that we want to investigate um, the feedbacks uh, that uh, due to the dynamic coupling between ice sheets and climate models and understand the impact of having ice sheets in a climate system. So for this, we really want, we really need the work of the ice sheet coupled to climate models. When we design our experimental protocol um, to be endorsed as part of CNIP6, you have lots of restrictions. So if you go to that uh, 2017 papers, um, the description in um, geophysical model development of ISNIP6, um, our protocol might be a bit, um, not make most sense. So for example, we have a lot of target for the coupled experiment on um, experiments such as the 1% CO2. And the reason for that is because um, to have an experiment as part of CNIP6, you need to have a certain number of 
um, a sheet model um, of groups having done that experiments before. So always remember that whatever you, you as you say, was based to basically join the synapsic community and we're constrained by that uh, in our design. Um, so um, what is our timeline? Well, so we started in uh, 2017, uh, I mean, sorry, in 2015. Um, there's a lot of that happened between 2015 and 2017, uh, but for the sake of clarity, I'm only zooming in um, the most recent years. Um, in uh, 2016, we did um, something that is called Init Greenland, which we're going to hear a bit more in my next slide. Uh, 2017 was basically the same thing, but with a focus for Antarctica, uh, for the cinnamon ash ash simulations. And then what happened is, um, you see in 2018, this Abumi, um, we have a new experiment that was not in the original protocol. And basically this was a member saying, hey, you know, listen, um, we, maybe we should have an experiment that really looks at um, how much buttressing the ice shelves in Antarctica can give to sea level rise and uh, create a new experimental protocol. So then we, uh, we agreed on this. Um, each year uh, we have, I mean every year since it's MIP6, we usually have a few workshops per year. We always have a one to two day pre G workshop, those are my little uh, diamonds that I read. We also have um, one to two hours HEU uh, splinter meeting that allows us to basically keep track with our community and try to build a community because we want to meet our members where they are. The big workshop of uh, last year um, was this um, a AGCM, AODCM evaluation workshop. You're going to hear a bit more about this. Uh, it was kind of a milestone for ISMIP 6. And the plan was that right after the workshop, the ice sheet model uh, would start the simulation, this blue line. Um, and this would happen at the same time as the um, ice sheet models coupled to climate models doing the simulations. Um, as you will find out, this plan has kind of slipped, um, but I don't want to spoil too much of the beans right now. Uh, we are planning our next workshop is going to be uh, in uh, IUGG Montreal in July, where basically um, we will need to evaluate uh, whatever results we have, because whatever is never going to change is that we have this IPCC uh, paper submission deadline, uh, which is at the end of um, January, at the end of December 2019. I mean, here at one point it was debated that maybe they would move to the end of January 2020, and so we were hoping that this was that, and, uh, but I need to move that back forward one month. So um, what uh, is happening for us is that um, in reality, this big plan um, is based on the fact that you have CIMIP climate model simulations that we can use to force our sheet model. Um, but the big but is that uh, there's been a huge delay in those simulations. And so basically there is uh, right now, um, I think only like one model or two that has done some projections. And so it's really a problem for us. So when we had a workshop in September, at that time there was actually was worse. There was no future scenario simulation for projections. So we were a bit stuck. Um, and uh, so that's one of the issues that we are limited by the availability of simulations that we can have to run our projections. But also the other part is that um, this delay in the expansion protocol also impacts our coupled runs because um, all the modeling centers are going to focus first on runs from climate models that do not have coupled ice sheets because those are quite simpler to run. Um, but, uh, well, this is just life. Uh, so, um, one of the big things that we um, have been doing as we were waiting for, I mean, in the last few years when we were waiting for CMIP6 to do their run, is really trying to ask questions about how we could obtain forcing for the synonym ice sheet models and get the communities ready to move promptly. And we did this via init-MIP, which is basically trying to understand um, the uh, impact of ice sheet sea level change um, due to and the evolutions due to the issue initial state. The other goal is to get the community ready, to get the formats and the data requests, the output grid that is relevant for being included into the CMIP6 archive. 
Uh, this sounds extremely boring, this goal too. It is so crucial though, and it's actually really, really challenging. I mean, CINIP6 has those huge sets of guidelines that we have to adhere to, otherwise our effort is not worth it. And the plot that I'm showing you um, is basically a setting that basically um, there is um, a sea level uh, in any projections that you're doing just due to the choice that you've made in your initializations. Uh, it's not really fair because I'm only plotting probably like 20, I mean 15 models when actually in Greenland, if I was putting the most recent results, we would have 35 of them, but then the plot would become very crowded and you couldn't see anything. Uh, but just to illustrate that we do have a huge number of actually models we wanted to take part in our effort. Um, this is a big workshop I was mentioning uh, in September. What was very nice is that um, it was a three-day workshop. We had 60 participants. You can probably recognize some of the usual suspects. But really what is pretty cool is that, you know, one-third of our participants were ice models, uh, one-third were oceanographers, one-third were atmospheric um, Modelers, and so this was sponsored by uh, NASA, uh, CLIC, AGU, and the WCRP, and the local um, Netherlands. So, uh, at that workshop, um, basically we made a U turn because we kind of um, we took the time to evaluate where we were in terms of forcing preparation and model selection, which you're going to hear more um, from Alice uh, later, so we'll not dwell into it. But we also realized that basically there is no way that we could have what we needed by the CMIP6 models. We could never, because it was not going to happen on time for us, we couldn't wait any longer. And so we had to make a good turn in the sense that we had to start using CMIP5 models. So this is our revised uh, GAN line. Um, as you can see, we're still hoping to have some CMIP forced um, projections, uh, but that will really depend on whether um, those actually come on time for us to be able to use. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, the revised protocol um, is actually um, quite simply uh, encapsulated into this picture. Because we are using CMIP5 models, it means that for um, getting atmospheric uh, forcing for the ice sheet models, we need to use original climate model downscaling. It's something that we were hoping not to do if we were using CMIP6 models because of the improvements that those models will be having. Um, so we're having a protocol that's uh, highly complex uh, and you can basically find all the information that you want and even more on a wiki that we try to keep up to date. Right, so the, uh, in summary, um, basically what are we trying to do for ISMIP6? Um, we want to provide a framework to link ISHIP modeling community to the ISMIP uh, because we really want to um, deliver sea level projections and making this part of really a new ISMIP6 data request. Um, our target is IPCC ER6, which means that for, some, for the whole five years to be actually worth it, we need to have uh, publications submitted by the end of December, um, so in a few months time, so it means a bit of a crisis. Um, but uh, we, have, you know, we do have an amazing community, and so um, there has been also over the years a lot of improvements in ISHIP models, and I really trust, I mean, I know that we will deliver that. But it's true really that our efforts, uh, all of those years would not have been possible without you know, the community buying that our modelers wanted to take part, being willing to do this experiment for us, helping us design the protocols. And really um, the most amazing part for me is the integration between the ocean and atmospheric scientists. Mm -hmm. And with this, I will stop. Thank you for having listened to me. Thank you, Sophie. That's very interesting. Um, I think in the interest of the discussion, we'll hold off on questions until uh, the next, until after the next speaker. Our next speaker, and we're very pleased to have uh, Alice Barthel from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, she's a postdoctoral research associate and a member of HILAT, the DOE High Latitude Application and Testing of Earth System Models Project. All right, can we switch to Alice? And Alice, you're still on mute. Yes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Well, thank you for um, joining this webinar. And thanks, Sophie, for this great introduction to the ISMIP effort. And today I want to talk about a section of that ISMIP effort, which is about using 
CMAP data to force ice sheet models, in particular, uh, how we went about developing boundary conditions for the ISMIPS effort. And this is a highly collaborative work. So I will be presenting results from um, a range of, of people, a range of contributions. And um, I put a list here of, of some of the major contributors. And this is really a collaboration across uh, communities uh, interested in the ocean, the atmosphere, and the uh, ice sheet modeling. Whoops. Okay. Um, as Sophie mentioned in her presentation, the uh, ISMIP-6 uh, project includes uh, standalone ice sheet simulations over Greenland. And uh, for those uh, ice sheet simulations, we need to rely on CMIP-5 data to force into uh, future climate conditions. And so in this talk, I'll be presenting, uh, mostly focusing on a task that was about determining which CMIP-5 models we want to use for this forcing, because the ISMIP-6 effort cannot cover all the available CMIP-5 data. So the first step is, what did we do to try to answer that question? Which CIMIP-5 model should we prioritize for the ISMIP effort? And then I will briefly describe how um, to generate, how we generated the ice sheet model forcing from uh, the CIMIP, CIMIP data. So firstly, um, the goal of that first step of model selection was really to recommend a subset of models from CIMIP-5 to produce this uh, forcing for the Greenland ice sheet standalone simulations. And for the case of Greenland, the CMIP-5 data is then used as an atmospheric large-scale forcing for a regional climate model and, and ocean uh, retreat parameterization. And what's important is that the ensemble of models that we recommend should uh, meet those two objectives that are, can appear to be competing. One of them is that we want uh, the models to present plausible climates near Greenland. And we evaluate that uh, by looking at the model biases over the historical period. But we also need the ensemble to include a diversity of forcings. And we do that by evaluating um, the differences in the projections uh, and the code similarities across the different models. And because there was no existing study addressing these objectives, we performed this new evaluation of the CMIP-5 models, combining ocean and atmospheric metrics, focusing on metrics that are most relevant to the ice sheet forcing, um, and including this, uh, the importance of the diversity of forcing. As a side note, we performed a similar analysis for um, the Antarctic ice sheet, and um, you can ask me for more information about that. But for today, I'll be focusing on the, the evaluation for Greenland. So to um, the first step in evaluating the quality of CMAP models uh, is to analyze the historical bias. And for this, we really focused on uh, three atmospheric metrics near Greenland. So all the biases that I'm gonna be talking about are calculated over the red domain here near Greenland and are comparing model results with examples here on the right hand side um, to the reanalysis era interim that we take to be our, our best estimate of historical conditions. And we focused on three different metrics, uh, one of them being the geopotential height which is an indicator of the atmospheric circulation. So if a climate model has a strong bias in that region, it means that the regional climate model will probably not have the right circulation and not the right storm tracks over Greenland. The second variable is precipitable water, and that's mostly important for the rainfall and snow deposition over Greenland. And again, if the forcing has precipitable water completely off, then it's unlikely that we're going to be able to simulate realistic surface mass balance. And the third one is summer air temperature, which is uh, particularly important for surface melt over Greenland. 
And this methodology um, for the atmosphere was based on a paper by Cecilia Gosta. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to look it up to uh, look into the details of the different metrics. For the ocean, um, we've calculated uh, ocean metrics in four different regions that are highlighted here in the four different colors around Greenland. And for the ocean, we're mostly interested in the temperature bias between the depths of 200 and 500 meters. So here is an example for the region in blue, Baffin Bay. And again, for each model, we can calculate the bias between a particular model, for example, here in a gray line, and um, our reference uh, ocean conditions, which is based on the World Ocean Atlas here in blue. And we integrate um, this bias in depth and over the, the whole uh, region. And so uh, we combined, we have those three atmospheric variables and those four uh, regional ocean variables. And once we know uh, those metrics of interest, we were able to gather an ensemble of 33 SIMIT models that, had, that we could evaluate. Then we normalize each variable with regards to the ensemble. And that's particularly important because that allows us to combine biases in different variables that have different magnitudes or different variability. And that gives us um, an atmospheric bias and an ocean bias that we combine into uh, a total bias. And here, um, this is a metric, uh, if the total bias has a low value, that means the model is performing well over the historical period. And so here on the right hand side, I'm showing you um, the top 25 of the 33 models that we studied ranked by their total bias. So here at the top is the best performing model over the historical period, and then the performance gets degraded uh, going down. For the ISMIP uh, 6 effort, we're mostly interested um, in the fact that the model performs relatively well, so we want my models to be in the top half of this uh, total ranking, saying it's is behaving better than most uh, of the models. The details of the ocean and atmosphere biases will also be published because it can be of interest for the modeling centers to know, for example, here are two models, CAN ESM and IPSL. They have a, a total bias that's similar, but one of them, CAN ESM, you can see that the, is performing well in the atmosphere but not so well in the ocean. Or IPSL, it's the opposite, it's performing well in the ocean, but not so well in the atmosphere. Once we've evaluated um, the model performance over the historical period, the next step is to say, um, how do these models uh, perform in terms of future projections? So for each variable of interest that we mentioned, we can quantify the future changes under the RCP 8.5 scenario. And here the schematic is just to explain that when I'm talking about quantifying future changes, we're simply comparing an end of 21st century climatology to an end of 20th century climatology. And that's our delta metric. And we calculate that for all the metrics of interest. On the right hand side, I'm presenting one of those metrics, which is the air temperature uh, over Greenland. And you can see different models have very different um, projections for the end of 21st century. All of them are warming, um, as you can see on the x-axis, which is the, the air temperature is increasing, um, but there's quite a range of, of projection. And so again, we can normalize uh, these metrics with regard to the, to the ensemble, so that we know if the model is sort of a low end or high end warming with regards to the ensemble. And another step that's important to address the question of uh, which CMET model we need for the ISMIP effort is to say, uh, how can we um, maximize the ensemble diversity? So for this, we introduced a, a variable uh, that I'm calling here E of N, where N is the size of the ensemble. And this ensemble diversity indicator is the sum of the model to model differences 
across all variables. And so here I'm showing as an example um, a matrix for if an ensemble is, is of size two, so just pair to pair. And you can see um, the distribution of, you know, which combinations of model would give us the higher diversity of projection. And so to finalize um, our CMIP5 model selection, we had to combine all those different selection requirements. The um, ISMIP6 uh, committee um, asked us to provide a top three, plus an additional three models. We had a practical constraints uh, for the regional climate model, um, including data availability, and in particular, the fact that we need sub-daily uh, wind data to run the regional climate model. And we wanted um, the model selected to be in the top half for the historical biases. And we wanted uh, the ensemble to maximize uh, the diversity of future projections. And so the selected uh, top three, you can see on the right hand side, includes uh, MIRAP5, NORI SM1M, and HATCHM2 ES. And these, these are different. Um, qualitative descriptions of their, their uh, future scenario under RCP 8.5. And for the additional three, um, our IPSL, CSIRO, and Access 1.3. In the time that I have left, I will just quickly say, once we have selected those CMIP5 models, um, it is uh, run to we use the data selected to force the regional climate model MAR, and those are simulation led by uh, Xavier Feitwis in Belgium, to give us a surface mass balance that we need to force the ice sheet model and surface runoff. And you can find more um, details about the methodology and the data on the ISMIP6 wiki. I put a link on this page. For the ocean forcing, um, the first step was to generate um, the ocean thermal forcing signal. And that is done by uh, adding the forcing from the reference climatology over the historical period, um, to which we add the CMIP 8.5 anomaly um, for each of those models. And so that gives us a, a time series uh, up to uh, 2100. And this time series, um, is available and can be used if modeling groups decide that they would rather use their own calving or melt parameterization. But in the ISMIP effort, we're also um, asking each group to use a standard parameterization for their ice sheet model. And this is a new retreat parameterization that was developed by Donald Slater. And here you have a, a retreat that is dependent on both the runoff, uh, surface runoff, and the thermal forcing. And this was um, the parameter K was determined from the observed values. And then you can use the, um, the, the climate model, regional and global climate data um, for Q and the thermal forcing to apply this parameterization into the future. And so here in um, the lower plot, you can see the time series of the, the retreat rates for each of the regions that are highlighted in, in the left-hand side plot. And what's interesting about this parameterization is that not only do we have a mean value, but we also have a range of uncertainty. And so we can apply um, a mean ocean forcing or also do tests with high-end and low-end uh, members. So just a quick uh, overview of the current status. These are the core experiments that are uh, being asked within ISMIP-6. And um, some of the models, especially the HAGEM data, is still being processed uh, by the regional um, climate model. But all the MIROP-5 data is currently available so that groups can start uh, running their experiments. And the additional um, models, three models are also being processed currently. So in summary, um, we've seen that the ice sheet models rely on the CMIP data 
to generate some realistic future uh, projections. And for this, we evaluated um, the CMIP-5 models and combining ocean and atmospheric metrics, focusing on metrics that are essential to force the ice sheet model, and giving priority to models that perform well over the historical period, yet provide a range uh, of uh, forcing into the future. In addition, uh, I've presented this new retreat parameterization that was developed, which uh, allows um, a standard forcing to allow uh, to provide um, to allow an intercomparison of the different models. And this parameterization depends on both ocean thermal forcing and the surface runoff. The forcing data to start the ice sheet model experiments is currently available, and more will continue to be made available. And finally, a similar work was performed for the Antarctic ice sheet models. And I'm, you're, you can look at the wiki page or feel free to ask me questions about uh, that if you're interested. And finally, I want to support the US Department of Energy for uh, supporting uh, my involvement in this work. Thank you, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Alice. Uh... That was very uh, comprehensive. So um, there are several ways you can ask questions. You can uh, interrupt us verbally. I think we're OK with that. Um, you can type a question into the uh, chat, which is a, uh, a button at the bottom of your screen for the, uh, for the Zoom session. Um, it looks like you can raise your hand. I'm not sure if you figured that out or not, but certainly Meredith could. Tim's here. He knows. OK. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's on the lower right of the participant box. The participant yeah. box. Okay. Um, but first of all, um, I guess I have some obligatory uh, performance elements questions for for Sophie. Um, so, uh, how many uh, coupled uh, ice sheet Earth system models do you expect for uh, uh, for ISMIP six? A uh, very good question. Um, I think so. In my original list, I had about twelve. In the end, I would say probably about six to eight will actually manage to do the protocol. Um, you have to remember, though, that those will be uh, mainly um, I should couple to the atmosphere component. So it means that uh, good Greenland projections. Um, Antarctica is still extremely, extremely hard because most ocean models do not go need the ice shelves. So um, even though we will have some good coupling ones, um, they would probably, I would only kind of trust the ones from Greenland. Can, can I ask a follow-up uh, to connect to what uh, Alice was mentioning that she covered Antarctica as well, but the ocean parameterization that you covered there, Alice was mostly uh, you know, you mentioned runoff, et cetera. I assume that's mostly applicable to Greenland. So what, what, what were the trade-offs there for Antarctica? So for Antarctica, there was a different approach in that there was a basal melt parameterization that's been implemented. So again, there was a slightly different strategy because we need first to get the thermal for forcing underneath the ice shelf. And that's something that we can't get directly from, from the CMEP models. So there was an extrapolation method that was developed and is available online um, to first generate the thermal forcing underneath the ice shelf. And then there is a melt rate parameterization uh, that is recommended for um, ice sheet modelers to use, which um, is a non, what they call a non-local quadratic parameterization, which is a function of thermal forcing, of local thermal forcing, but also thermal forcing uh, across the, the ice shelf region. And so th this again um, is, is provided, the data is provided, and is provided with a sort of uh, parameter and a low end and high end parameter so that we can test the sensitivity to the parameterization. Okay. And you have a lot of additional information on the ISMIP-6 uh, wiki, uh, looking at the specifics of, of the Antarctic projections. Okay, thank you. So, can, I have a question? can I just add one quick thing? So basically, the one thing to um, 
those new parameterization for both the ocean from Antarctica and Greenland, they were done for ISMIP-6, really by a team of dedicated oceanographers that really worked with ice sheet models to kind of say, hey, can you do this? No, we can't. Hey, can you do that? No, we can't. And so it really, I mean, if anything comes out of ISMIP-6, even that basic interaction, um, which can be very complex, was for me a huge success of ISMIP-6. The Antarctic parameterizations were de developed in part by Zeiler, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Absolutely, by Zeiler, especially for the generate the thermal forcing, and then by Nicolas Jourdain, based in, in Grenoble, to um, generate the, the basal uh, melt parameterization. Okay. We have a question from Laurie Padman for Alice uh, to explain the choices uh, from CMEP5. He suggests that uh, it didn't look like a full spread. Uh, I don't know if you want to add any details to that. I think the, for us, the primary um, effort was to have uh, some assessment of, of CMIP5 data that was already, um, I would say, readily available. And so I think a 33 model ensemble is, is pretty significant. I mean, if that it is true that we probably missed a couple of, um, of models. Um, for, for Greenland, the difficulty was that um, we really required um, data to be available at sub-daily frequencies to force the regional climate models, and uh, we could only find uh, less than 10 of uh, those models that had um, sub-daily data available. And I, again... I I, yep, I think I need to clarify the question. Okay. Uh, you showed three models and one of them had uh, for the atmosphere in the ocean was median, median. Mm -hmm. One was high for one and low for the other. Absolutely. There wasn't, there, there wasn't, a, there wasn't the opposite choice of low and high for the same choices. And I'm wondering what, okay. why that selection. Yes. Well, that selection was the one uh, that maximized the difference across all variables. Partly um, it's because we don't have models that map all that space. Um, so for example, it's actually really difficult. We have um, not that many models that have a strong, like a, a weak ocean warming, a very low end ocean warming in the future, for example. And so, um, the, the best we could do was get, you know, one of those, uh, a, a model um, with, a, with a low ocean, but we couldn't get, for example, a model with low ocean and high atmosphere. Um, so out of the, mo the, the models that we had available with sub-daily data, that was kind of the best way to, to cover. And, and yes, we, we weren't able to cover but, all of the, the bases or the combinations. But for Antarctica, we do. For In Antarctica, we definitely do. We have high atmosphere, low ocean. Uh, we cover all of those basics. And then the, the other point is that the experimental protocol, so we have those three core experiments, um, but then we have um, an additional th uh, three EODs. Oh, that way. Lost, all yeah. the Could I follow up on, a, on this topic too? This is Phil Rash talking. Go ahead. It was just to ask, um, if you had all of the 33 models available, would you have made a different choice of models? What would have, what would have been different? I, I, I actually, I'm asking the question because some models that I anticipated you might use didn't get selected, but I'm, I'm then assuming it was because the data wasn't available, but I'm interested in whether I missed on what um, the, the strategy was for, for the choice. So, I mean, you're welcome to be specific if you want to know why a specific model was not selected. Uh, in general, what we found is that the model that the models that had sub daily data available were in the in the top half. Uh, most of them, I guess, one of them wasn't. Um, so, in 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 some sense, they were in the right range of of models. You know, they they were suitable candidates for the selection. 
Um, it's true that uh, if we had the choice for of, of all the other models, um, there are other good candidates in that ensemble that, that could have been selected. Right, well, the um, one that I was looking for, uh, clearly, as a person who has a background with CESM, I thought that was among the higher fidelity models in mm -hmm. the initial scoring, but it didn't end up being used in this exercise, right? Yes, and so, um, CSM could have been selected. I mean, there was one um, technical difficulty in that CSM has pretty uh, warm atmosphere. And so that sort of downgrades it um, over Greenland um, quite a bit. And then, so it, it was, it was, it was considered that's um, fine. It was just, it, I was sort of interested. And since you, you invited me to name them all. Oh, uh, no, absolutely. So it was definitely considered. It definitely uh, wasn't the favorite candidate of the atmospheric <laughs> modelers because they say they just get way too much melt over Greenland with uh, CCSM4. But do um, I oh yeah, I was talking about the CESM1. Oh, the uh, CESM1. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. That's a different uh, one. And the other, the, the other issue is just maybe my maybe I misinterpreted the results, but it seems to me in one of the slides that it was indicating that it was in terms of the fidelity score, it, it ranked among the top models. I Absolutely. So I think from what from what I remember, and I can um, open up the the slide again over Greenland. Um, yes, the CCSM one Camp Five yeah. is actually the best performing in the, the total bias over the historical period. Yeah. And the main reason that it, it didn't get selected or didn't get prioritized is that we didn't have the availability of the data as far as I'm aware. And I did chase up with people at NCAR to know if they had data that they hadn't made available and they said they didn't. So. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That's absolutely unfortunate. So, I mean, you know, yeah, for yeah, everyone. For everyone, I'll let, I'll let you know as well that there was, this was one of the the consequences or artifacts of the the CMIP five, well, of the ESMF um, submission process is that at times some of the data sets actually got lost and were were even though they were in, they were submitted to the inventory, they weren't readily apparent. And so this is one of those situations, I suspect. Enough. I, I don't mean to take no, that. And, but you know, and then for 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 if we do manage, we we're keeping really an eye out on the uh, CMIP six submission because I know that CSM has made a lot of progress in the surface mass balance and a lot of change, you know, between CMIP five and CMIP six. And so I'm really cannot wait for that model to come out. And as you know, I I hope that as soon as we get data, we can just basically uh, plug it in and uh, use it as one of the CMIP six models. Thank you. Uh, so, Sophie, you, you indicated that um, next on the calendar is um, uh, a meeting in Montreal to kind of uh, assess the data prior to um, submitting it. Um, so I'm required to ask, as part of our uh, performance elements, uh, if the uh, LiveKit developed by uh, DOE or CMCT developed by NASA would be used in that analysis. <laughs> um, CMCT will be because I'm biased. No, <laughs> so I, I sponsor the CMCT, so that's why I am biased in using it. Um, but um, yeah, I th we we are, for example, adapting the CMCT a lot to make this useful. Um, the lift kit uh, has been used in the analysis for Greenland, actually, from Heiko. Uh, when he's doing his an evaluation. So uh, yes, those tools are very helpful because especially you have to remember that uh, as a new MIP or as a new type of model in a CIMIP uh, type of a uh, world, um, all of the tools that really work well for typical climate models do not really work well for us. Um, and so we have to develop those analysis tools. So having those developed for us is very useful. So uh, speaking of, uh Along those lines, Sophie, um, you, you, you giving the history helped me better understand the context of ISMIP 6 and relative to sea rise, which I was a little more familiar with, and also how it is, you know, a sort of generational step and how you uh, evaluate ice sheet models versus and, and include data from the climate models. So 
Um, it, am I correct in, in thinking that uh, with as we approach the end of calendar year 2019, that will be with the paper submissions, that would be the end of the initial ISMIP 6 effort, so to speak. And would, would, a, would a later effort uh, aim to, uh, ISMIP 7 potentially, uh, aim, aim to uh, achieve some of the elements that were, that were hard to get, the, that were hard timeline wise uh, for the, uh, based on the CMIP 6 data? Do you want to describe the future after his MIP 6? Yeah, um, that's a very good question because basically we already know that the deadline is going to be so tight that we are starting writing the key papers without any results right now, right? This is the only way we're going to cope. So it means that we're going to manage to submit by the end IPCC deadline to December 2019 is going to be like the most basic kind of analysis. These are the key numbers of sea level and the area. Now, any okay. cool... Yeah. But you'll do that, but you won't, uh, you know, there won't be any hand wringing like there was in AR4 because a good faith effort will have been made to assess the future of, uh, of the ice sheets in a somewhat coupled way with the climate. And I, I don't think that's any different than any of the other MIPS either because they're going to do this basic assessment for the IPCC, but then following that there are these interim reports now. Uh, yeah. which are based on CMIP-5, like the uh, Special Report for Oceans and Cryosphere. Yeah. So I think, I think there'll but be think, continued analysis, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like all the front analysis and all the, you know, all the analysis about, you know, why do we really get this from this model or why do we that? This is going to happen afterwards. So oh. like 2020. Um, and then as we kind of like digest our analysis, yes, we're starting to already talk about this MIP-7, what would that look like? Um, and hopefully kind of lessons learned from our members that they're reading, what could we change? Yes, we should have in hindsight started working earlier with CMIP 5 data for not being in the show, such a crush right now. It's something that we were not willing to do because we were so much wanting to use CMIP 6 models. And so maybe one of the first thing that we'll be doing is actually doing an CMIP 6, CMIP 6 real projections, you know, the, the, what we were really trying to do at the beginning um, but we couldn't because there was no model output. So yeah, we... Is there potentially value in that given that it is a relatively new MIP to be a generation behind in the climate model projections that you use? I don't, is that even permitted in the, in the context of the IPCC? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, there is value um, because this is what happened for, you know, see what's nice to see, right? We still contributed. Um, it makes it harder to write the sea level chapters um, but uh, that's something that we are communicating with the lead authors. Um, so, um, you know, we try to do things such that, you know, like a reference project that we're considering for SMIP 6 is the same as the SMIP 6 one, even though they're using SMIP 5 models. And so, you know, it's kind of makes it a bit more complicated, but we are really trying to. Um, there will be value because, as I mentioned uh, to Phil, is that, um, you know, we really wanted to, CSM, for example, has changed so much in the SMB. And so basically the plan um, for in that, using that model would be to bypass, trying to bypass using regional climate models if we can. And so even if after the deadline has um, passed, um, there is still value. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it takes so long to get the ISHIP models ready to do an experiment that if for ISMIP 7, we end up being roughly close, working cl more closely to what the dream was to the climate models, we'll probably be using the uh, data differently in the implementations. And so the sooner we start developing the strategy for this, the better. Okay. Well, that, yeah, I agree. Uh, any qu other questions from uh, the audience or any of the other team leaders? You can raise your hand or you can just ask a question. So I have a question. I'm Wilbert uh, for for Alice. Um, so there was this, um, this this figure that you showed where you indicated the, the the shelf regions basically on which you would evaluate the oceanic quantities. Um, I was a bit uh, surprised to see that that many of these areas um, actually extended away from from Greenland. For instance, in the Labrador Davis Strait, where you also had a very significant an area on the on the Canadian side. Um, can you comment on that? Why why that specific choice? Why not really focusing on the continental shelf of Greenland? 
Yes, so again, this was a, a, a combination between trying to have enough data points in that area. So the, the first thing I want to mention is that what I plotted is the, the region as in the uh, spatial extent that we're considering, but we're limiting them to um, areas that are shallower than 1500 meters. So we are limited to, to a shelf. We're not taking the, the, the deep ocean uh, properties. And I think the, the balance there was to try to get um, enough data points from the CMET model, but also enough observational data points into a reference climatology that we felt that comparing to a historical climatology actually was meaningful. And um, yeah, the, there are not quite as many observation, as many data points as we would like in the various regions around Greenland. Okay. Thank you. I have another question for Sophie. Uh, so one of the more consequential decisions I thought that came out of Sassenheim was uh, not to initialize for the pre-industrial, uh, but for a reference period closer to contemporary. Uh, could you say a little bit about how that decision came about? Yeah, so one of the issues that a lot of the state-of-the-art models um, have when they face trying to get the initial state is that they have to assimilate all of the observations. So models like uh, ISSM or the one that's developed at Los Alamos, um, when you initialize, you need to have observations, and basically there is no observations of the pre-industrials. So that's kind of like, <laughs> it kind of limits us. Um, so, so yeah, that's the motivation for starting closer to uh, present day because um, it's, uh, you know, this is, you don't have to, do. but that was actually also in the initial ISMIT X protocol, actually, if we look closely, um, you know, we have a present day initialization and a present day control um, so we kind of knew that was going to happen. So that was not a huge surprise, um, at least not for me, but maybe I didn't communicate that very well. Um, because it is true that a lot of our models that will also take part. Um, and what we've learned from it, and so I guess what the, in Sessenheim, we also looked really at what we've learned from the init MIP efforts. And what it was really shown is that all of the models that do the pre-industrial control, who could have started the way that Richard was mentioning, end up being much fatter and bigger than the present day ice sheets. And so it's kind of a problem because if you then uh, try to use them for sea level projections, um, the numbers may be much bigger just because they're trying to remove a lot of the ice that shouldn't be there first. And so, but we didn't know that for sure how bad it would be until we did in admit. So, yeah, it was a confirmation that something for present day is probably better. Okay. I'm being told that maybe we have less than five minutes. Okay. Well, then maybe we should, uh, well, thank you to the speakers. Uh, and thank you everyone for engaging. Uh, we should return very quickly to the, uh, the portion of the agenda that we, we skipped. <laughs> if anyone wants to share any uh, updates briefly. Um, I, I can go very briefly and say that uh, Operation Icebridge uh, is about to bring, begin its last Arctic Spring campaign on board the P3 next week, and uh, everything's on track for that. So we'll soon be surveying your, your favorite chunk of Arctic sea ice or the Greenland ice sheet, or perhaps a Canadian ice cap or two. Uh, and so uh, look forward to updates from that. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? All right, great. Uh, okay, well, in that case, well, thank you everyone for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sophie and Alice, for uh, uh, updating us on uh, the, the state of BISMIP 6 and how we're getting uh, CMIP 6 inputs into it. Uh, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing the papers. Good luck uh, uh, getting them done in time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And yeah, thank just you. one uh, final follow-up comment. Um, yeah, thank you again, Sophie and Alice, for a really terrific uh, hour. I know I have a ton of questions that we could keep chatting. So I guess I would just encourage everybody on the webinar, you know, if you, you had a question that you wanted to follow up, that we can keep these channels open. Um, I know professionally, sometimes I feel a little bit shy to uh, bother people or 
you know, what the etiquette is for following up questions. But um, I think sort of the point of these IRP collaborations is to, to keep those channels open and, and to be open with one another um, if there are some follow up inquiries. But um, thanks again, and really looking forward to uh, continuing this, this dialogue. Yeah, couldn't have said it better. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, great.